Ladies and gentlemen, well, let me welcome you to uh, today's event uh, on workshop on quantum computing with a subtitle Variational Quantum Algorithms. We are organizing this type of workshops uh, every year. The IT for Innovations National Supercomputing Center, located at Technical University of Ostrava in the Czech Republic. And it is a great pleasure for us uh, to have speakers that will focus on quantum variational algorithms this year. During the workshop, the two basic types of uh, variational quantum algorithms will be introduced the quantum approximate optimization algorithm and the variational quantum eigensolver. It will be shown how to convert real world problems into quadratic unconsidered binary optimization from and how QAOA and uh, can then be used to solve them. Similarly, the practical use of uh, VQE will be shown. The focus will be mainly on showing linear system of equations, optimization of power grids or examples from quantum chemistry. And it's a really a great pleasure for me to welcome here colleagues uh, from uh, uh, IQM, from uh, SURF, from uh, TNO, and from LRZ. And it belongs to the leading uh, bodies of uh, Europe. And of course, uh, to, to be, belongs to the group of leading uh, organizations in the world. Okay, so maybe I will ask first uh, Jirka uh, if he is able to share his screen. Okay, so um, hello again, everyone. My name is Jirka Gudjarkowski from IQM. I, uh, I work at IQM in Germany, in Munich, in the applications and algorithms team. And uh, I will tell you something about kind of like a basic introduction into the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, also known as QAOA. Yeah, so um, throughout the talk, I will um, start sort of build up the motivation towards QAOA, describe what kind of problems we are interested in solving and then how to solve them first with quantum annealing and then how QAOA is developed from that. Uh, and then in the last part, I will talk a little bit about how is this applied to well, not exactly real world problems, but problems that are a little bit more real world than just uh, some toy problems. And then uh, also a few slides about what uh, kind of research we at IQM are doing uh, regarding QAOA. So let's start with uh, combinatorial optimization. So there's a lot of optimization problems and optimization problems are in many, many different disciplines. Um, sometimes when people talk about optimization, they, they mean uh, some kind of continuous variable optimization, uh, which you know you can imagine you, that you could have this kind of graph of energy landscapes, but that's not what I'm going to talk about here. Like for these kind of problems, we can use some kind of calculus methods to find the minima. Um, but not, not, no, I'm going to talk about uh, combinatorial optimization. So in these kind of problems, um, the number of solutions is so, so the, the the variables that we work with are always discrete or at least mostly discrete um and, and because you know of the different um values for the different variables we have very large uh, solution space and so these problems are typically np hard classically uh also very often it's kind of graph problems as you can see here on the right <clears throat> one of the such problem is the max clique so that is uh, uh, given a graph. We are looking for a combination of vertices that are all connected with each other. And you can see here that even on this very small graph, there's a lot of different quadruples of vertices uh, with only one of them being a clique so that they are all connected to each other. So that uh, then solving the problem is um, difficult because we cannot use some kind of calculus to like tell us in which direction we should need to look for the solution. And that's a lot of the solutions, a lot of the possible solutions and only one of them among them is the best solution. So there's a lot of problems. Maybe you've heard about traveling salesman problem, the Knapsnack problem before. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of different applications where these problems appear in a lot of different fields from logistics, medicine, computer science, uh, both theoretical computer science and also like the design of computer hardware, for example. So um, it's a really kind of important class of problems to look into. And to give you a kind of like a taste of what it is like, uh, we can we will look at uh, the max cut problem. 
so in this problem, um, it's very easy. I give you a graph, like you can see over here, and I want you to divide the vertices into two groups, not necessarily the same size, uh, so that the number of edges between the two groups of the vertices is the largest, right? So like you can think of it, if you cut the graph in half, uh, then you know you want to cut the largest amount of edges. So you know you can think about it, look a little bit in this graph over here, and you can see that that even for eight vertices, it is relatively difficult to to find the, the maximum cut, kind of like you know on your own without any computer program to to brute force it for you. Uh, but I have brute forced it for you, so uh, I will now go to solution. Yeah. <laughs> so this 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 is the the, the max cut on this kind of problem. As you can see, uh, we cut almost all the edges except for two. Um, but now if we want to formulate this and some kind of optimization problem for, for, for a computer to solve, uh, we need some kind of cost function. Now, the most natural thing is, okay, we want to maximize the number of edges cut, so we can just have a cost function like this. We sum over all cut edges, add one for each one of them, and that will be our cost function. That's nice, but uh, it's not really very, so to say, easy to get our hands on it. So what we can instead do is that, okay, we will assign a binary variable to each vertex, that's either zero or one. And now uh, our cost function can look like this. So we sum over all edges of the graph, and for each edge, we will take this kind of formula. And you can see for yourself that if this xi, xj are both one or both zero, this will add up to zero. But if they are different, zero and one, this will be one. And so, in effect, it does the same cost function as we saw before. Now, as we want to move a bit towards the quantum, sorry, excuse me, towards the quantum um, setting, we will set the variables, uh, we will make the variables be one and negative one. Um, so now this is basically the same thing as before, just, you know, instead of having zero and one, we have negative one and one. Uh, now we can have a different cost function that will be a little bit simpler. So we simply sum over all edges, z, i, z, j, and now if they are both the same, this will be positive. If they are different, it will be negative. So it is a good cost function to, to kind of minimize. But now if we want to uh, put in a quantum computer, it's, it's a relatively easy step. So um, we can take that each um, vertex will be one qubit. So qubit with state zero and state one. And instead of the variable little z, we now have the expectation value of the z operator. So the z is this Pauli operator. And if the state is in state one, it gives expectation value negative one. And if it's in zero, it gives expectation value one. So now we also move from a cost function to something we physicists would call a Hamiltonian. So now a Hamiltonian is an, is an operator, is the sum of this product, tensor product of these two Pauli operators, Z acting on the sides I and J. And then um, again, looking at it from the physicist point of view, uh, now, you know, we don't say that we look for a solution to an optimization problem, but we look for a ground state of the quantum system with this Hamiltonian. So ground state is, again, just a synonym, the state with the lowest energy. So state that minimizes the Hamiltonian. And so also we could say the cost function. So now we formulated this as a quantum problem. Still doesn't look like we've gained so much. Uh, but now we can tackle it with a quantum algorithm. Okay, let's not say algorithm because this is not still not uh, exactly the quantum computing that you may have heard about. But this is this process called quantum annealing. Now, the idea of quantum annealing is relatively um, simple, logical. So we start with a system uh, with a different Hamiltonian. So you know we now forget about the cost Hamilton, the cost function Hamiltonian, and we come up with a different Hamiltonian, such as. Uh, the x operator over all the vertices of the graph. So x operator is again one of the Paulis, looks like this, and it has the eigenstates plus and minus, where the plus state is zero plus one, minus is zero minus one. Um, but if we have a Hamiltonian like that, it's very easy to solve sort of by, by, by hand. <laughs> you can see that the, the ground state of this would be a quantum state that is uh, the plus state on all the different vertices of the graph. So now this is the starting ground state, but it's not really a problem to solve it. That's uh, really trivial. But now what happens in quantum annealing 
is that we slowly uh, change the Hamiltonian of the system with some parameter t. So we started with the mixer Hamiltonian is what we call it, the, the, the initial one. And then we slowly change towards the final one. And what happens is that if we do this change slowly enough, the, the system remains in the ground state throughout this entire process. So if you draw the kind of energy levels as we change the Hamiltonians, the system remains in the ground state. And here we need to be careful about the gap between the ground state and the first excited state, because if it gets too close, then, then it might be possible that the state sort of jumps up. But if we do it slow enough, it remains in the ground state. And so at the end, we have the system in the ground state of this difficult cost Hamiltonian. And all we have to do is just measure the state and we have a solution to our problem, theoretically, at least. There's a lot of kind of asterisks Asterixes about, about uh, the details of quantum annealing, but this is the idea as it is. Um, and so just, just to note, uh, like, you know, this, I, I still haven't talked much about any kind of gates. So this is not like an algorithm for a quantum computer where you write out the circuit, but there are quantum annealing devices that are designed with exactly this in mind. And so they have these qubits and they slowly change the Hamiltonians and at the end they have the measurement. Um, and so they, then they can be used uh, exactly for solving these kind of problems. Now, if we want to dig a little bit deeper into what is happening, um, one thing that we can do is look at the like what is the, the quantum state of the system. So you know we start from the Schrodinger's equation, and from the Schrodinger's equation we have here on this left side uh, the time evolution of the quantum system. So we start in the plus state, and then there's this relatively complicated thing. So normally for time evolution, you take the exponential of the Hamiltonian, but here, because the Hamiltonian changes, we need to take this integral and with time ordered, but it's, it's a relatively complicated thing. But one thing that we can do is to approximate this by simply evolving the time with the mixer Hamiltonian and the cost Hamiltonian kind of um, first one and then the other several times over. So, so you know, we can start with plus, then evolve it a little bit with the cost Hamiltonian, then a little bit with the mixer Hamiltonian. And then this product says that we do it over and over again. So again, a little bit with the cost Hamiltonian, a little bit with the mixer Hamiltonian. As you can think of it as like in this graph, this blue line would be what happens in quantum annealing. So we slowly change the Hamiltonian from uh, this value here all the way to here. Uh, but in what I've just suggested, and it already spoils a bit where I'm going with it, um, is that an alternative is that we sort of switch the Hamiltonians abruptly from one to the other. So we evolve the state a little bit of this Hamiltonian, then we switch this Hamiltonian, we switch this Hamiltonian, and, and etc. And now this might look like it's a really, really crude approximation, but actually there are some results from optimal control theory that say that in, in, in some ways this uh, kind of abrupt switching is, is uh, more optimal for I don't know, speed, I think, uh, then uh, it is this kind of continuous change of the two Hamiltonian, uh, of, the two, for, of the two Hamiltonians. On top of that, uh, one thing that I didn't mention very much is that uh, here when we do the time evolution with the two Hamiltonians, I also added these uh, parameters there, beta and gamma. So this would be just some real numbers. Uh, they kind of correspond to the time over which, uh, like for how long we, we have the system with this Hamiltonian or this Hamiltonian, as you can see on this graph, like this is the beta and gamma. Um, but we can theoretically um, change these however we want. And that is um, basically the origin story of the QAOI algorithm. So the QAOI circuit looks exactly like what I described before. So we start with the plus state and then we alternate this time evolution with these two Hamiltonians with these two parameters, beta and gamma. So as a quantum circuit, now finally on a quantum computer, uh, it would look exactly like this. So you start with pluses and then you have these layers, these green boxes. You can have several of them. Typically it's called P, the, the number of layers that you use. Uh, and in each layer, there's this time evolution of the cos Hamiltonian and then time evolution with the mixer Hamiltonian, which was just the X gate. So the time evolution is just the X rotation. Uh, so there's this yellow thing here. And we repeat this many times over. Then we do a measurement. We see what kind of solution we found. 
And then uh, we employ some kind of classical optimization, some classical computer that takes these measurements and based on this uh, determines what are uh, good values of gamma and beta to try next. And so then there's this sort of iterative loop where we run the quantum algorithm, we, we do this, this, this time evolution with these parameters, do measurement, evaluate how good it is, and then suggest new parameters. And then we do this over and over again until we um, converge to, to what would be like the optimal values of this beta and gamma uh, that, yeah, that give us the, the, the lowest energy solution. Um, you can think of this, this beta and gamma as sort of kind of like uh, having some flexibility in how fast the quantum money link is happening. So just if I go back here, like here, it's just very primitive where we would change this uh, continuously, but with, by, with this blue blue line, but by fixing this beta and gamma, we can sort of uh, influence like how quickly the, uh, the two Hamiltonians are interpolating. The one more thing to add here is that here in this uh, blue box, it still looks relatively opaque, um, but it's actually not. So in our case, if the cost Hamiltonian looks like this, so it's some overall edges of the zi and Z, zi and zj gate, uh, when we exponentiate it like this, it will look just like these three gates. So controlled knot, then rotation around z, and another controlled knot. So this basically gives us the entire cookbook for how to um, how to do the time evolution here and how to write this circuit. So um, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, this is. Basically, just what I described, uh, how it works. We initialize the parameters, run the QPU, calculate the expected value of the of the cost, come with new parameters, and keep repeating until we minimize the, the cost. So that this is the QAOA algorithm. Now, uh, as I mentioned uh, just two slides before, um, so let me just go there. Uh, if we want to, you know, to do this, 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 this blue block over here, we need some Hamiltonian that looks a little bit like this, so that we can easily transform it into gates. Uh, and so, in general, this is a class of Hamiltonians that we call quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, or QUBO, Q Q U B O. And so, this would be a whole class of optimization problems that. Uh, classically, have a cost function that looks like this. So it's quadratic in these classical variables xi and xj with some matrix qij. Quantumly, looks very similar. Uh, so it would be a Hamiltonian with these z gates, where there again would be some matrix of coefficient jij, and and there can also be this kind of single side term that acts only on one vertex of the graph. So in the case of MaxCAD, we didn't have a single side term and this uh, JIJ was just a constant and was only for all the different edges in the graph. Um, but this is this is this very important class of problems that, that we can solve relatively easily with QAOA. Uh, in physics, sometimes they call them the Ising model. Uh, even though the Ising model itself has, is a bit more specific, but, but this is like an Ising type uh, Hamiltonian. But then uh, there's a lot of optimization problems that don't look like this. For example, the traveling salesman problem. Uh, but then for that, there is this uh, very famous paper uh, called Ising Formulations of Many NP Problems. And this paper is just like a list of a lot of the famous NP hard and NP complete problems, such as the Knapsnack problem, such as constraints problem, and all of them, um, all of them that you can think of. And it gives their formulation in terms of, of this kind of quadratic cost function and these kind of Hamiltonians so that you can sort of use it almost as a cookbook with a little bit of some overhead where you might need a little bit more qubits that then there's variables in the problem, uh, but it's, um, it's kind of there ready to be used. Now to show you an example <clears throat> of how that looks, we can look at the traveling salesman problem. So for those of you who have not heard about this problem, it's a problem on a graph, a weighted graph. So each edge uh, has a weight assigned to it. And it represents uh, cities on a map where the weights are the distances between the cities. And the traveling salesman needs to visit uh, every city exactly once and uh, tries to minimize the distance uh, traveled overall throughout the graph. So, so we want to find a path that goes all the way throughout the graph 
It minimizes the, the sum of the weights uh, of the edges that it travels on. Uh, now, this is not quadratic unconstrained binary problem. Okay, we can think of, yeah, it, it is binary if we define these binary variables, x, i, j, which means that the salesman visits city i in step j, where there is like the same amount of steps as there is uh, cities. Uh, but then we have constraints, right? We have constraints that every city needs to be visit, it, visited exactly once. So when we sum over j, it needs to be equal to one. Uh, and in every step, the salesman can visit only one city. So we sum over i, it must also be equal to one. But, you know, now is the time when we look at the paper that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, and it tells us that uh, we can add these constraints into the Hamiltonian as uh, penalty terms. So we, 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 from hard constraints, we make like a soft constraint, but we can still make them hard enough <laughs> uh, that, that it's never uh, advantageous to break these constraints in order to, to sort of get a lower uh, value of the cost function. Uh, so here's an example how the Hamiltonian would look. So the, the, the full Hamiltonian will have these two terms. Uh, this B term is the, 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 the classical cost function. So it's uh, sum over all the edges and then over all pairs of vertices uh, where this is in step J and this is in the next step, J plus one, I, K. So if these both of them are equal to one, uh, so again, this would be the binary variable zero or one, but if both of these are equal to one, then uh, you know the salesman travels between cities i and k in the jth step, and so then we add this weight. So this would be the sum of the weights. This, this cost function overall, and the second part of the cost, cost function over here in these parentheses contains the two constraints. So so this thing in the parentheses should be equal to zero. Um, now to make kind of like sure that it equals to zero and that it's uh, quadratic, we square it. So now when this is squared, if it's zero, it's still zero. If it's anything positive or negative, it becomes something positive. <coughs> and then we multiply it with some constant A. So here we have constant B, here we have constant A. The important thing is to have a constant A big enough that it's never uh, beneficial to, to evaluate any of these constraints. Um, so that then um, the, the, these are always satisfied. Uh, now there's, of course, a lot of wiggle room is that, uh, you know, there is some kind of lower bound on A where we have guaranteed that it will never be violated, but we also don't want this A to be too high uh, because then the most of the Hamiltonian would be this, this, this A term. And then the effect of this uh, B term would be a little bit um, overshadowed. And then the optimization wouldn't work that well because it will just try to satisfy these constraints at all costs. And it will kind of not care very much about minimizing this, this second term. So how am I doing on time? Okay, good, all good. Um, now, another example of how the, this QOA can be solved to solve some a bit more generic problem would be uh, in something like rail traffic management. So um, I just, brought up this game here. Okay, it's a board game, maybe you know, Ticket to Ride, um, but it kind of showcases what is the problem that I'm talking about here. Uh, so in this game, each player draws a card or multiple cards, and the cards tell them uh, which two cities they need to con connect with railways. So for example, a car would say, you need to connect Madrid with uh, Danzig, or you need to connect Rome with London. And then each player try to build the roadway, or railways, and of course they block each other a little bit by building into each other's uh, uh, territory. Um, and so this is, is a little bit reminiscent of problems that happen in real life. If you imagine some kind of uh, railway network and you have a lot of trains that want to go from different cities to different cities, they can't all just go directly the shortest route because they would block each other, they would collide, there are some kind of conflicts. Uh, and so then this traffic management problem is about how, where do we route these trains so that they don't block each other and minimize some kind of cost function, something like the total delay or um, the, the, the economic cost of kind of like going in some longer route or something. You can see of like even in this game example, for example, if, if one person builds for, uh, rails from Barcelona to Paris and another person from Madrid to London, if the person from Barcelona goes through Pamplona and Brest, 
And then to Paris, it kind of blocks a little bit the expansion of this person trying to get there from Madrid to London. So, so there's kind of um, different alternatives to consider. Now, this is a very complicated problem. There's a lot of constraints. It's definitely not in the cubo form. It's definitely not quadratic unconstrained binary optimization. Uh, but there is a way, again, in which we can transform it. And the solution looks like this. So for each train, we can you know, forget about all the other trains and generate some kind of like a small set of possible routes, say like top five, five shortest best routes for the train. Um, now we take all of these routes, routes for all of these trains and we put them in a graph. Uh, and in the graph, we make edges between incompatible routes. So like two routes that conflict with each other, that it's impossible to execute at the same time. Uh, also between routes, like two routes that are of the same train because the train cannot do the two routes at the same time, right? We connect those that are that are like physically impossible to do together uh, for whatever reasons. And now in this graph, if we look for the maximum independent set, so the largest number of vertices that are not connected together at all, then this would be our solution. <clears throat> because the, the, these vertices that are not connected at all, they are all compatible with each other. Um, and, and, you know, so, so now we've changed this from tra rail traffic management to, to the maximum independent set problem. And the maximum independent set, again, is, is, uh, is sort of relatively easier to transform into Cubo. It would look just like this. So we have some uh, negative term that sums over all the different vertices so that if the vertex is selected to be in this independent set, uh, we get some energy reward. And then we sum over all edges. Uh, and then if, if the, the two ends of the edge, the two vertices are both in this independent set, we get some energy penalty. And now again, like we only need to set this penalty high enough that it's never worth it to add two vertices into the set that are connected by an edge. And then this kind of Hamiltonian, if we would take this and run the QA away with it, it would find us the maximum independent set, which by the way, is another NP complete problem. Excuse me. So yes, um, now in the last part of the talk, I just want to highlight some uh, research that we are doing at the QAOA at IQM. Um, one of them is about this phenomenon called parameter concentration. And um, it's kind of like an um, empirical thing that, that we noticed uh, that for some problems, when you run the QAOA loop, the QAOA optimization, uh, the parameters gamma and beta <clears throat> will always tend to be at some fixed value, at least for, for, for some, uh, like, so this is a gamma one and beta one. So this would be in the first layer of QAOA when you run the optimization, the parameter always tends to be uh, like, they always tend to be this kind of value. Now this is of course, dependent a bit on the Hamiltonian on the problem structure. So, so the, this particular results, they are for uh, the max cut problem on three regular graphs. So this would be graphs where each vertex is connected to exactly three other vertices. Uh, but yeah, that, 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 we noticed that there's this uh, parameter concentration and this is um, sort of relatively interesting for um, practical purposes of running the QAOA because this means that whenever you're solving a problem from this class, you, you don't need to do the optimization, right? Like if you trust this parameter concentration, you can just set these parameters to be at these values from the very beginning, and you don't need to include them in the optimization loop. <clears throat> or, or you can include them, but you can just like set them at this value already from the start. So, so then the optimization is, is much easier uh, for the classical optimizer to do. So in this sense, you kind of warm start this QAOA loop uh, where, where you skip a little bit of the classical optimization and that can also help uh, the runtime of the overall optimization. So you are also less likely to be stuck in some local minima or um, as we call them, barren plateaus. So that is uh, when you are in some kind of space of these parameters gamma and beta where um, the derivative of the cost function with respect to these parameters is almost zero. So it's like almost flat. And therefore it's really difficult to find like what is the optimal or like in which direction should you change these parameters to improve the cost function because it's it's almost flat and all the derivatives vanish. Another thing that we are doing at uh, QAOA is 
together with our partners from this company called Parity QC, is investigating this uh, thing called Parity Encoded QAOA. This is a very interesting um, kind of approach. <clears throat> The, the the kind of issue here that this is trying to address is that in, in a lot of these optimization problems, you have graphs that have very high connectivity. So a lot of these vertices are connected to each other. So then if you want to map it on a quantum computer, you have some problem because you cannot have all the qubits connected to each other. Like typically on, on the kind of quantum computer that we have, you would have uh, the qubits connected in some kind of square grid. So, so you know each one will be connected to four other qubits. And so then if we want to um, do the QAOA with, with cost function that has this kind of connections, uh, we would need to apply a lot of swap gates that put that put the qubits together so that then we can apply the gates between them. Then we need to swap them all the way back. And it's not very efficient. And so the way to address this is to add one kind of one more sort of layer of mapping <clears throat> called this parity uh, parity mapping, parity encoding, uh, where in the new kind of problem, each vertex or each qubit will, will again sort of be binary, have two values, but it will correspond to the relative parity of these two uh, qubits in the previous problem. So for example, here uh, we have qubit one, qubit two, qubit one and qubit zero. And so if these both of these qubits are the same, then this qubit will be zero. And if they are different, then this qubit will be one, right? The same thing is here for the zero two. If uh, two and zero are different, uh, it will be one. If they are the same, it will be zero. And the same is for this one, two. And now this has um, the property that it changes these uh, two body terms, these terms that act on two qubits in the previous problem into just a single side uh, terms that act just on a single side, right? If there is some interaction between these two qubits, if it wants them to be the same, then it will push this one to be zero. If it wants them to be different, it will push this one to be one. Uh, but also, uh, so, so, so this, this is kind of great that it changes these non-local terms into local terms, but there's a little bit of a price to pay that we also need to have these kind of uh, some terms to, to make sure that there is a uh, consistency. So for example, these three uh, vertices over here, they cannot all be one because that would mean that zero is different from one, one is different from two, and two is different from zero, which is classically not possible. So there needs to be some kind of local term that acts like on these three going around and also on these four and also on these four, we would call them like a placket terms that act on this kind of uh, square of qubits over here, over here, over here. So those are some kind of details of this uh, of this mapping. And also um, then you need a bit more qubits in, in, than, than previously. So they're like quadratically more qubits. So, so it has also some, some performance problems. And then we are now sort of researching with, with Parity QC about like what are these problems of this mapping? How can they be remedied? And how can it be used uh, in the best way possible? We just had recently a paper from one of my um, magnificent, awesome colleagues. And so that was everything from my side. I hope you have a lot of questions because uh, I think I didn't take all of the time that I originally asked for. Um, uh, that was uh, everything that I had prepared. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thank me to Yiji Gudiarkovsky uh, for his talk on quantum approximate made uh, optimization algorithm and its applications. And uh, I will ask uh, to anyone who, who is here to ask for uh, any question he has. Okay. I have no, we have no questions in the chat. Uh, so can I ask directly? Yes, please. Hmm? Okay. Um, so I was wondering, can you go back to the slide where you have the uh, gamma and beta parameters that you find? Yeah, this one. Oh, sorry. A little uh, bit forward. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, the parameter for the system. Yes. yes. So this one, basically, you're saying for different system sizes, um, so different number of qubits and nodes, you have uh, the same sort of optimal solution in terms of gamma yes. and beta. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And so this is mostly showing that for different system sizes, it's, it's concentrating more and more like sharply, right? The peak is more sharp, more focused. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, 
But it's so important what, here that it's random free regular graphs, and this is only mm -hmm. the first gamma and the first beta. In, in right, I okay. don't know how many how many layers exactly was here, this experiment. Okay, so you don't expect um send it, so, so like the second gamma and second betas. You don't expect them to be the same as well. Um. Yes, could be. I'm I'm not sure because I, I didn't do this research. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know all the details. But uh yes, yes, that it's possible that this would happen only for the first uh first gamma and beta. Um yes, but but maybe it would also happen for, for the next ones, maybe around a different parameter, or maybe the peak would be a little bit wider. Um mm -hmm. this is something to, to look into. And especially in to look into it for some other other problems that are a bit more closer to the application side again, because this is a bit arbitrary. Okay. All right, thank you. I just wanted to ask that. Okay, and I saw a question in the chat. Yeah, we uh, have one more question in the chat. If are there yes. in the past parity QC slide physically all to all connected? Yes, so, so that, that is, Kind of the thing, the 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 the, so the answer is no, and that's exactly the point. Is that uh, if we wanted to do uh, QAOI on just using Hamiltonian of this system on the left, either we would have to have all the qubits physically connected, each one of you know all to all, or um, we would need to do uh, these swap gates. So it's like a two qubit gate that swaps two qubits, and this allows you to move the qubits around on the chip so that you can put qubits close to each other that didn't start close to each other and then act on them with whatever gate you want. Uh, and so this parity mapping avoids that because this parity mapping only uh, has interactions that are on, on the single qubit, which kind of corresponds to the parity of the two qubits before. And then on these uh, plackets, so these groups of four qubits here in the, in the bulk and like three qubits here on the edge, which ensure the consistency so that there's uh, in this sort of new um, architecture so that there is always an um, odd number, so, so there's always even a number of ones in each of these circles, right? Because odd number of ones wouldn't make sense. As I said here, if all of these three were ones, then it would mean that zero is different from one, one is different from two, two is different from zero, which is not possible. So you have to have these kind of local terms that act on these four qubits at the same time. So this is, for example, one of the things to research, how to do this kind of on the hardware side, uh, because we would need to have this local gate that acts on these four gates at the same time, four, four qubits at the same time. But otherwise, um, the, 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 the big advantage of this mapping is that it is uh, only local and it doesn't require any more all-to-all -all connections or like long distance uh, connections. Okay, so we have more questions now in, in the chat. Uh, Can I ask one question? In the consideration, in the theory part of the, this picture, they consider the facet, or just they work with the graph in the combinator commutative in the combinator combinatorial part. Sorry, I didn't understand. What was the first thing? Not the graph, but the facet. The facet. They work with the facet, or just with the graph, with the one with the one dimensional structure. In this picture, mm. you know the facet, for example, uh, for example, because in the homological algebra, um, um, uh, it is possible that, for example, they consider it inside also inside of the graph also, mm -hmm. not just work with the edges, and after that with the homological algebra, they transfer to the two dimension to the just graph graphical point, and uh, in this way they continue. I want to know that also. I don't know, but uh, maybe you know uh, that uh, in this picture also, they consider in this way, they work in the theoretical background in this way, or no, just they consider as a max cut also the same, that they just connected and they just consider three, uh, the graphical parts. Uh, okay, so, so sorry, I have to apologize. I don't um, understand the, the probably the theoretical background that you're referring to. Um, like in this this kind of mapping, it is designed for these uh, cubo problems that I've mentioned before that are on the graph that have the form of uh, like uh, like this, 
So, so the Hamiltonians basically have to look like this, uh, where you have these two body terms acting on like between two of the any vertices. Some of them can be zero. Some of them will correspond to the different edges. And then these single side terms, uh, and then these term, this kind of a Hamiltonian will get mapped into a Hamiltonian on this kind of graph, where there will be only these single side terms and these plucket terms in between, like this. That's kind of all there is to it. It's not uh, to, to sorry. It's not specifically uh, complicated on, on on the theory side or something like that. Sorry, that's the best that I can say to that. Uh, maybe you know I can point you. You can look into parity QC. Basically, the 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 whole company <laughs> was started when the founder uh, wrote the paper on this parity encoding. That's why they also have it here in the logo. Um, but but like you can look up the company and they have a lot of papers that they publish on different aspects of this encoding. Uh, for example, how it looks when when the original graph is not all to all connected, but only in some specific pattern. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff to read into. Uh, but but like generally, it's a bit uh, it's like a very interesting thing to look into. But the the quadratic uh, scaling of the number of qubits is 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 a big kind of a killer. Uh, that it it um, it's it's not really good for the performance and, and like generally in a lot of cases it is not worth it to do this uh, mapping at least that's our conclusion. People from Parity QC disagree a bit, uh, but it so so to, just to give you an idea that it's uh, like a really active um, field of research. Okay, so uh, let us go back to, to chat. Um, maybe, uh, Yiri, it will be better if you go directly through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I see a question from Jan Priestnitz. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, so yeah, that was exactly what I was saying. <coughs> yeah, yeah, the number of qubits here uh, scales uh, scales quadratically. And so that's, that's like a big problem. Um, for 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 this uh, for this parity encoding, and yeah, there are some some like details where you can take advantage of some symmetries, for example, or um, uh, kind of that. There's a little bit of like freedom, for example, that here you choose uh, to define these parity qubits and put them together so that they create these uh, loops, right? So for example, here you have zero two zero three one three one two, so that will correspond to zero two. Uh, 0, 3, 1, 3, and 1, 2. So like this loop of these four up together. Uh, but there's some freedom in how do you arrange these, and then you could have different loops. Um, but but So there's a lot of kind of uh, variables in there. Uh, but, but generally, yeah, this, it's a kind of the, the main problem of this is that there's this overhead in the number of qubits. And then it depends on whether it's worth it for, for us or for any anyone else using it uh, to have these more qubits. Uh, but, you know, as a bonus, not, don't have any of these non-local interactions that this is sort of trying to uh, avoid. And then I have I see question that seems that VQA and QAOA are identical. Um, I would just say that um, the main idea is similar. In VQA, you also have these parameters and you optimize over them. Uh, but the specific form is, is typically different. So that's, uh, if I just go back here, uh, in, in QAOA, we specifically have these layers of changing these two Hamiltonians one after the other, so that it again mimics the QAOA, as I said on this previous slide. Uh, and this is, um, as far as I know, this is different. So like in VQE, you have some very different thing here with the different parameters. And I'm, I'm sure that that's what the other speakers will talk about, so I don't want to um, say too much. <laughs> Okay, uh, what exactly the system size value means? System size. Uh, system size. Um, sorry, where was it? Uh, I would just say that means the number of qubits. That could either mean the number of variables or the number of qubits. There was system size over here, so here it means both because this is max cut, so the number of variables and the number of qubits is the same. Um, yeah, that's what it means. I think this data was done from uh, simulations, uh, not on a real quantum computer, but uh, an emulated one. That's why the system size also isn't that high, because then when you get into the 20s and 30s, uh, that it becomes uh, impossible on small classical computers. 
Okay, so if we have no more questions, then let me thank to uh, the first speaker once again. Uh, thank you, Yuri, for your talk. And so uh, let me welcome here David Meyer from SURF. All right, so I'm, I'm David Meyer. I'm from SURF in the Netherlands. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about harnessing quantum algorithms for efficiently solving linear systems of equations. If we could get to the next slide. Yes. So we now heard uh, a little bit uh, in the previous talk about uh, QAOA. And we saw there that uh, quantum computers uh, or quantum algorithms have uh, yeah, great applicability in solving uh, optimization problems. And now we're going to apply uh, similar principles to solving linear systems of equations. So uh, in a way, we're adding yet another algorithm that is kind of same, but I promise it will be different. Um, and we're going to see also how variational approaches um, can solve similar problems as non-variational approaches and offer um, for the same problem reduced circuit length at the cost of classical optimization that we have to add. And for this today, we want to, or I want to focus on two example algorithms. The first one is HHL, of which you already see a little um, diagram there on the bottom that I will later go through step by step. And this uh, promises very large speed up, um, but re requires basically fault tolerant quantum computers because of the long circuit length. So then I will also present a variational um, approach to this uh, variation of quantum linear solvers which has been specifically designed for uh, NISC devices, so kind of near-term devices. And if you can go to the next slides. Um, yeah, I will start talking a bit about linear systems problems. Then on the next slide, uh, I will talk about HHL. Then the next slide, I will talk about BQLS. And then I will, in the end, go over, introduce a little bit of a small framework that we've um, uh, put together for our members, uh, especially universities and students there. And then I will um, go over a use case. So kind of concretely show you how you can map a concrete problem in this case, track reconstruction of uh, the LHCB um, detector to a, such a system that can be then solved with uh, these linear solver um, algorithms. If we go to the next slide. Yes, so linear systems problems, they are all around us basically. They there's a lot of uh, complex modeling or complex problems uh, in all sorts of fields, physics, engineering, economics, um, and the works that kind of apply um, that are based on their systems of equations, for example, circuit analysis or portfolio optimi uh, optimization, just to name um, two. And there is also a host of uh, classical approaches to solving these. So for example, Gaussian elimination, LU decomposition, yakovic gauss seidel method, or uh, conjugate gradient. Uh, grad gradient. Um, but they're all quite computationally intensive um, in growing system size. Um, and see here, here on the right, I've um, kind of made a little graph and uh, where you see some different scaling. So um, gauss, uh, Gaussian elimination or these elimination methods, usually they scale kind of with n cube or n square. Whereas um, some of the best uh, conjugate gradient methods, they get to kind of linear scaling in N, which is quite good already. But now if you look at quantum mechanics, we kind of think, oh, a, the evolution of a quantum state is kind of given by uh, uh, linear equations as well. So one might say quantum mechanics are linear by nature. So maybe this could be something that uh, yeah, can solve this quite elegantly. If we can go to the next slide. Yes, and so this was then first introduced, this idea was first uh, introduced or explored in 2009 by Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd, um, which uh, gave the algorithm their name in their paper, Quantum Algorithm for Linear Systems of Equations. And here the idea is to use uh, quantum phase estimation and eigenvalue inversion to gain an exponential speed up over um, the, yeah, the classical methods. So instead, of scaling uh, linearly in N, we now scale logarithmically in N, which is the purple line in the graph over there. And we see that's already for yeah, relatively small system sizes, we perform radically better, of course. However, um, this speed up comes with some caveats. 
um, for example, sparsity, um, condition number, and uh, some readout, but I will elaborate on this uh, in more detail later. But uh, the circuits are, as I said, typically very long. Um, so, I mean, circuit depth of a million is uh, for some small systems is uh, quite normal, I would say. Um, and so they're not suitable at all for NISC devices that we currently have. If you can go to the next. Um, yes, and therefore variational quantum linear solvers were proposed in 2020, which is a variational quantum classical hybrid approach where we use again, like with the QAOA, we use some uh, classical solvers to optimize, optimize a parameterized uh, circuit. We have less speed up. So typically the scaling here is heuristic and depends a little bit on the problem, but we'll end up somewhere uh, in between kind of this linear scaling of the classical approaches and hopefully somewhat close to the logarithmic scaling of uh, HHL. And these algorithms, because they have much shorter circuits, um, they are very suitable um, for uh, current devices already, and we can already run some yeah, toy models at least, um, or yeah, bigger toy models even on uh, current devices. We can go to the next slide. Yes, there is one important thing to point out though, and this is that we do not have access to the full solution vector as opposed to the classical approach. Because in both or in all of these um, um, approaches currently, we end up with the solution of the system in the amplitude um, of the final uh, quantum register. Uh, and so this means we don't have access to the whole vector. So we are very limited to problems where we can either work with some sort of an expectation value of the, um, of the solution or, um, yeah, or some partial um, solution, or I don't know, we can do some amplitude amplification or these sort of things on the solution or search for some maxima, these sort of things. But this is important to keep in mind. And next slide. Yes, and so now, uh, as promised, I will go through the HHL algorithm first before we look at the VQLS, and I'll go through this step-by-step. Step. So if you can go to the next slide. We'll start from, from the left, uh, from the start, uh, and then the next slide, I'll tell you all about it. Um, so we start by encoding uh, our problem into the typical form of a matrix A times a vector uh, X uh, equals some vector B. And sometime, or maybe we have to do some discretization to get our problem into this shape, if it's a continuous problem, but uh, yeah, we will end up in this shape. Uh, a has to be encoded in the Hermitian matrix. If it isn't already in Hermitian matrix and already in the original paper, the first thing they explain is a very easy way to turn any kind of matrix uh, into this Hermitian matrix if you can invert it. And B has to be encoded in the amplitudes of a quantum state, which is normalized. Um, and this already comes with the first constraints. So if a uh, vector B is not close to uniform, then uh, straight preparation is likely very costly which will negatively impact um, the exponential uh, speed up. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we come to the quantum phase estimation, the next uh, points, the next slide. Um, so now here we then uh, add a quantum register or a few quantum registers to encode the eigenvalues. Um, and we transform our matrix A into a unitary operator e to the IAT and apply this to the system to sort of imprint the solution on the quantum state for different times t. And this, um, in more <laughs> physical terms, translate, translates via the quantum phase estimation into the ability to decompose the vector b in the eigenbasis of our matrix A uh, and to find the corresponding eigenvalues. This already brings the next constraint, which uh, is that A needs to be sparse and efficiently row computable um, and this allows then this um, quantum uh, Hamiltonian simulation to be um, efficiently simulated um, in the scaling with n. So again, if this is not, uh, if there's no efficient way to do this, um, then uh, we again lose our speed up. Next slide, please. Then the next big part, um, I'm grouping there a few steps in one and the explanation because they kind of belong a bit together and are repetitions. So if you go to the next slide, um, the next step that we do is we do then an eigenvalue inversion. So we again add an other register, an auxiliary qubit, and we rotate the system uh, conditioned on the eigenvalues. And um, here we bring in the next constraint, 
um, the condition number of the matrix A, so the ratio between the largest and smallest eigenvalues, um, it shouldn't be too large because if it becomes very large, uh, the matrix um, cannot be inverted or the solution at least becomes less stable and this is bad. So uh, ideally the condition number is small or at least somewhat independent of the system size. And then we just uh, do uncomputation, uh, so a reverse quantum phase estimation. And then um, we have a superposition of um, uh, two states, basically of the control qubit, the auxiliary qubit. And then if we measure uh, one on the auxiliary qubit, we obtain our solution, which is uh, the inverse of A times B equals X. And since this is probabilistic, we uh, probably have to repeat all of these steps until we get the result. And you see this in the next slide. Um, uh, that we have this block in the middle there um, that we potentially have to repeat uh, until success. And then that leaves us with one last step on the next slide, which is the measurement. So as I said, the solution vector is now in the amplitudes of the quantum, final quantum state. Um, and if we measure a quantum state, we will collapse the state. So if we want to measure all um, or every single component of the solution vector, we lose any speed up and everything that we did was kind of uh, useless. Um, but we are, of course, allowed to uh, apply some operations. We, as I said, we can um, apply, uh, we can, for example, uh, look at a, um, a expectation value of some observable or so on, or I yeah, can look at some, at the high, can try to find the highest uh, component or, so, or the lowest, something like this. So we need to be a bit creative um, with uh, how we extract the solution. This is constraint number four. Uh, next slide, please. So we saw now that we can have potentially get an uh, exponential speed up um, if we have one efficient state preparation, B, um, a, uh, secondly, a sparse matrix. The matrix is also well conditioned, third and fourth. We do not have access to the full solution. And, and uh, yeah, so we need to have some problem where this is the case. Typically, I said very long circuits, so not suitable for NIST devices. So now Ooh. let's get a variation on. So next slide, please. So this brings us to VQLS. Um, as I said, this is a hybrid approach to variational prepare X, such we get such that we get some AX that is proportional to the solution uh, B. Uh, we can here reduce the circuit depth, which is the main goal of uh, using a variational approach, at the expense of, uh, at least in this case, <laughs> at the expense of additional classical optimization. Um, uh, we have then short depth quantum circuits. Um, to evaluate a, a cost function efficiently. And they depend uh, on the, the parameters of a gate sequence, sequence um, that we use to prepare X. We then use a classical optimizer to minimize the cost function. And we iterate this process until we uh, reach a desired position. So next slide, please. So here we again have uh, the overview. So this looks uh, very similar maybe to uh, what you saw about the QAA, QAOA, but with some uh, differences. And again, I will walk you now through this step-by-step step, as I did with HHL uh, on the next slide. So we start again with uh, the input and here it is quite similar to the HHL. We need an efficient gate sequence U that can prepare our solution uh, vector B. We then need a decomposition of our matrix A into linear combination of uh, L unitaries. So this is uh, basically similar to the assumption that we have in VQE that you will hear about later maybe, uh, that the Hamiltonian is a linear combination of Paulis. And we need an ansatz, uh, a variational ansatz for um, how to prepare our vector X, our first initial guess kind of. And this can be, for example, in hardware efficient ansatz, or a QAOA, which confusingly here means quantum alternating operator ansatz. <laughs> so not to confuse with uh, the previous um, talk. Exactly. And then we can uh, go into the algorithm on the next slide, um, which is the cost evaluation and the classical optimization of the cost. So now we can um, come up with a, a cost function. And um, this very simply is just the overlap between the projector AX and the subspace, which is, which is uh, orthogonal to B. So basically, if X is exactly the solution, this overlap will be zero. Um, and so gradually, as we get closer and closer to the perfect solution, this cost function gets closer and closer to zero. 
And because this, if we use it as the global overlap, um, this can also lead to the Bering plateau problem. Um, we can also instead do um, this as a just as a local cost function where we just look at the local overlap. Um, for, but this is mainly necessary if we go to uh, large system sizes. And in this initial paper that I um, cited in the beginning also, um, they also come up with this connection here on the right-hand side between the cost, for example, of the global, but they also come up with a relation like this for the local cost function, where we can relate the cost um, to the um, uh, precision epsilon and to the condition number uh, k um, of the matrix. So basically that means if we know to what position we want the solution, we know how uh, when we can stop this iterative process, so when our cost function is low enough. And now here on the bottom in this little image, you see uh, in the part of the quantum computer, we now have a bunch of uh, smaller circuits um, that we can use to evaluate the different terms um, in our cost function. And we can use this, uh, we can do this using the Hadamard or the Hadamard overlap uh, test, which has been introduced in this paper and some classical post-processing, which basically means we run a bunch of short circuits and then we um, add them together and then we have the cost. Um, so indeed, there are multiple circuits that are necessary, but they're all relatively short, which is good. And then uh, once we have calculated this cost, we run some classical optimization, for example, gradient-based um, on this cost, and we come up with a new set of parameters, alpha, um, that go into our circuit to prepare um, a, a new guess for x. And we keep iterating this process until our cost function is low enough. So that means until x is close enough um, to our solution. Uh, next slide, please. And then we come to the last part, the output. Um, so the output of this will be a set of parameters alpha for our variational circuit that prepare x um, up to a certain precision epsilon that we kind of uh, set out to, to get. The uh, scaling is heuristic. Um, in this paper, they show that the scaling is at worst linear in the condition number of A, logarithmic in the precision, and poly logarithmic in the linear system size uh, n. So that's uh, pretty good. Um, again, here the same as this with HHL, and I can't stress this enough. The solution is in the amplitude of the quantum state, um, because we, it's quite shocking to me how many papers are just uh, at the end. Oh, and then in Qiskit we get the whole uh, so solution with a exponential speed up, and then we're done. Um, that's not it. We need to um, still do something with the solution to have uh, yeah because we can't get just everything. It has less speed up than HHL, but it is suitable for NIST devices, so you can use it soon. <laughs> That's very nice. Next slide, please. So at SURF, um, we also yeah, try to work a lot with our members and also students, and so um, and different researchers also, not just students. So we made a little software package on GitHub we will try to bundle uh, different implementations of um, quantum linear systems algorithms in a single Python package. So if you want to play around, you have a, your problem and you have everything set up, then you should just uh, be able to get our package and try different algorithms and see what happens. We have some something going on simulators mainly, of course, but also we have some code for real hardware, for example, IBM Q or AWS. So in theory, you should be just able to execute this if you have an account there. We are currently supporting Qiskit as the main thing, and then Classic, which is this kind of more functional um, uh, programming-based language that can also optimize your circuits um, just to play around with. Um, we have hybrid and purely quantum algorithms, um, and it's fully open source on GitHub. And here's the link and also a QR code to this repo, but you can also just uh, search for our surf uh, quantum repository in GitHub and should be able to find it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and now as the last part of my talk, um, I'm gonna talk you through a, a use case that's also been done using our, our framework and has been published uh, this year, um, which is um, quantum, named a quantum algorithm for track reconstruction on the LHCB vertex detector. And this is a particle track reconstruction use case based on icing like Hamiltonians, which you already heard something about in the first talk. And the idea is basically I have some detector, uh, some, some particle uh, collider uh, with some uh, layers of detectors after the collision point. And this particle will crash through these detectors and leave dots on the detectors. 
um, and then we end up with a, a bunch of layers with dots and we want to find out which dots belong to one track. Uh, so kind of going from the left side of this picture to the right side. Um, next slide, please. And so the issue is why um, people were looking into this again is because they want to upgrade their detectors. Um, so kind of going to the high luminosity area of these experiments where they have a lot more um, events and a lot more tracks. And then they were looking at, oh, is there anything better that we can do than the current approaches, which are purely classical? Um, so they, they looked into these new approaches and came up with a, a new formulation of the problem as a minimization problem of an Ising-like Hamiltonian, as you see it here on the bottom. Um, and the, this Hamiltonian can have different terms of that describe kind of how bent these terms can be or how much they can bifurcate in these uh, different things. And the inputs uh, that we have, it would be some collection of hits left um, by n particle over n m detectors, like we have it on the bottom here. So it's, uh, yeah, we just have these dots in the detectors. Um, and uh, the output that we want to have is a, a vector s um, that for each of these kind of uh, combination of dots, so these doublets they call them, uh, say is either one if the doublet was part of a track or zero if the doublet uh, is not part of the track. So kind of the difference in this picture would be um, the colored ones that are part of the tracks, so that would be one, and the gray ones would be zero. They're not part of any track. And so now in able to be in order to be able to use uh, the quantum algorithms, we have to choose an interaction matrix A um, and a bias vector B such that the minimum of H corresponds to the solution of uh, the tracking problem. And the classical matrix inversion um, that they tried first, it has similar performance, so in terms of uh, precision that the current approach, but it scales much worse in the system size. So they wanted to see, uh, can we use quantum linear systems algorithms, um, for example, HHL? Um, yes, and as you see on the bottom here of the slides, yeah, if you take the gradient of this um, Hamiltonian, <laughs> if you take the, the gradient of this Hamiltonian and... <laughs> sorry, could you mute yourself, please? That would be awesome. Thanks. Hey, I'm going to take a look at this. All right, so I'll just start you on. So if you minimize the if you minimize this uh, gradient for a minimum of this Hamiltonian, then you'll have the exact form that I said is necessary. So you end up with something like a times your solution vector uh, equals b. If you can go to the next slide, yes, um, yes, perfect. And so now what was left to do for them in their paper was basically to show that their use case fits all the constraints. So they were able to show actually that in their use case, the, mat the matrix um, is extremely sparse, which is very nice. They were able to show that the condition number is upper bounded, irrespective of system size. So that's also really good. We can do the eigenvalue inversion in effectively, efficiently. Um, their solution vector is basically all ones and then normalized. So that can be uh, constructed very efficiently. It's basically a single Hadamard gate per qubit. So that's great. Um, the quantum phase estimation they named as the main limiting factor because they weren't able to find an efficient implementation um, for the unitary operator. So that's uh, a bit sad. And uh, then on their solution, they actually just state, did state vector analysis on the resulting quantum state. So they didn't, um, again, didn't um, identify any observable that would be interesting for them to measure, but they mentioned that um, basically what they could try because basically their vector is either has entries that are either one or zero uh, ideally um, they could try and do some um, amplitude amplification to the result and then maybe they can they can just evaluate um, kind of a few they don't have to get the exact values of each of the entries they just see okay these yeah these are the ones that are one and these are the ones that are zero so that's also nice and um, with HHL they saw that the circuits were way too long already for a super small toy problem. This was order of thousands of uh, gates deep and uh, even like minimally a bigger problem. It was already into the hundreds of million gates, but they were able to show that they have basically 100% uh, hit purity and hit efficiency, which is their key metrics. So that was very, very nice for them. And that brings me then to the final slides. Um, one back, exactly a little recap. 
um, what we heard about today now, um, which is that quantum linear systems algorithms offer up to an exponential speed up over classical approaches. The speed up comes with a number of caveats, um, which have to be taken into account per use case. So as I just said, for example, with sparsity, you show that your matrix is sparse, you show that you can prepare your states and so on, and that you have some idea of what you want to do with the output. There's algorithms to do this on false tolerant future devices, which are very uh, efficient, as, but as well as algorithms that we can use on current or near-term NISC devices, which for example, BQLS that we looked at, the first use cases are being explored. They're really trying to, to use these, these algorithms and show that they, they can be uh, useful in practice in their, in their experiments. And we have an open source framework that uh, you can use to play around with this at SURF that is open to everyone. And with this, I, I thank you all for your attention and apologize again for the technical difficulties. Also, thanks to Marek for the walking through the slides for me. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your for your talk, David. It was beautiful. So let us start with our next speaker, this uh, Nils Neumann from TNO, and we'll talk about quantum algorithm for secure energy grids. So the stage is yours. Okay. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. So I'm Nils Neumann, and, and I'll present work that we at TNO did for uh, Alianda, and Alianda is a a network provider in the Netherlands, electricity network provider. Um, and it's a collaboration between the, the parties that we see uh, here down below. And, and the work is, is done by a team. So I get to present this, but it's definitely not the case that I did all the work here. Um, so what we did is um, we tried to, to help Alianda see if we can tackle some of the energy grid challenges that they encounter using quantum algorithms and if we can do that now or maybe in the future so what's the problem exactly um aleander is a um, has an energy grid and and they use that energy grid to provide power to households in the netherlands but also to uh, users and with the energy transition and the the changes in the in the energy production we know that the electricity grid has to change. We have to update it. We have to reinforce it. And we also have to make sure that if the electricity grid fails at one point, that we can uh, overcome this failure. We can uh, uh, still provide the electricity to the, to the customers. And the challenge that Aliana faces is that in the next 10 years, they have to increase the network uh, resources by as much as they had done in the last hundred years. And this comes upon the added challenge of uh, a shortage in technicians and in the in the uh, supplies and the resources to to increase the network. Okay. The problem that we specifically focused on is the n minus one problem. And the n minus one problem means that a single failure of a cable, a single uh, cable outage should be uh, fixable. We should be able to reroute our network such that if a single cable breaks, that we can still provide uh, everyone with electricity with a minimal number of uh, switches, with a minimum number of, of interventions, so to say. So what does it look like? Well, let's represent this this electricity grid by a simple graph. We see uh, solid orange lines, and these lines are active. We see nodes, and those are um, intermediate points. And we see dashed lines, and these dashed lines are inactive. They are present in the network, but they are currently not used. And these inactive edges can be used to, to fix the network in case that something breaks. So suppose that one edge breaks, indicated by this red cross here. We want to reroute the network so that everyone still has electricity. But cur because currently these three nodes here at the top, they, they don't get the electricity that they need. And we directly see that this dotted line does give a valid reconfiguration, does give a valid, valid new network. 
And we also see that the network shown here as a whole is not n minus one secure. Because if, for instance, one of these tables here at the bottom fails, then there's no valid reconfiguration because the only connective edge that we had was this one. So the task is to, to find valid reconfiguration, but also to know if the network as a whole is N minus one secure or N minus one compliant. And now on to a, a second simpler example. Suppose we have this small graph, we have a single outage, single cable that fails. And instead of one edge that we want to switch off and switch on, we now um, increase the, the problem. We can switch off two active edges, one of the active edges being the one that fails, and we can switch on two inactive edges. And if we do that, then we see that we already get many, many reconfigurations. And uh, not all reconfigurations are equal. Some reconfigurations are better than others. And that has to do with the fact that we're dealing with physical networks. Uh, physical networks, they, they tend to have some, some limitations on the capacities that they can handle, for instance, the, the currents that they can handle but also on uh, how easy it is to, to use them. So we want to, to have a reconfiguration. We have to switch as few edges as possible, but also in such a way that the edges that are, that are turned on um, still meet the constraints that they, that they have. So not too much current is, is transported over these edges. And this is this is a hard problem. This is a difficult problem that that Aliander has to deal with on, on a daily basis. And you see, as network size grows, that also the the computational time grows. And especially for the larger networks, computation time significantly increases, and up to such a point that it's it's not. Um, it, it becomes it becomes a burden, especially if we have to increase the networks, if we have to uh, make it more robust for the future. So can we use quantum computing to to help here, to, to bring this line down? And the idea behind this is that in some way, we can maybe prepare a superposition over possible reconfigurations and then use a quantum operator to only obtain those reconfigurations that are valid and to use deconstructive interference to, to remove the invalid reconfigurations. And this is the idea on a high level. And we explored this idea in both a gate-based quantum computing approach, so um, using the IBM and the Google machines, and on a quantum annealing-based approach using the machines of uh, D-Wave. So let's first look at the gate-based quantum computers. And very short, gate-based quantum computers are very similar to the laptops that we currently have. On a low level, uh, our laptops or personal computers work using gates, using switches on on uh, low level bits. And if you do that in the right way, then you can perform algorithms, you can give presentations uh, across the internet. And gate-based gate -based quantum computers work similarly. You have uh, quantum gates that you apply on quantum, cube, quantum bits, qubits. And if you do that in the right fashion, in the right way, then you can perform universal quantum computations. So you can uh, solve all problems in some specific class. You can solve problem. You can solve problems. And for gate-based quantum computers, there's a near-term and a long-term planning. So for the near-term, we have to deal with noisy devices, noisy devices that have significant losses, 
And these losses come, for instance, from the low decoherence times. So information is only stored in the qubits for a very short time, which limits the number of operations that we can perform. The operations that we can perform are noisy, are imperfect, as well as the measurement that we have to do to extract information from our circuit. And we can also not uh, interact all qubits with each other. So there's some uh, connectivity that we have to deal with. And these near-term devices, these NISC devices will be special purpose. They will have a, a special task that they are good in and they will usually not be good in solving other tasks. For the long term, we envision fault-tolerant devices and fault-tolerant devices have logical qubits where um, some error-correcting code is imposed on groups of qubits that can correct errors, that can uh, make these qubits robust to errors, and that uh, allows for longer uh, computations and computations where we do not have to care about uh, errors in individual qubits. However, we expect that it will still take years before we have these fault tolerant computers. So for the algorithm, for the gate-based um, uh, for the gate-based quantum algorithm, we first considered what the classical algorithm is. And the classical algorithm is first they, they check which reconfigurations can we find where only a single switch off, switch on is necessary. So where we need to have KS2 actions. And actually in 90% in of the cases, this already solves a problem. And if you have these 90% of the cases, then we are only interested in these, these last 10% because these are the hard cases. In these last 10%, we need to have more edges that we switch off. We need to have more edges that we turn on before we have a valid network, before we have a network that satisfies the constraints on the currents and on the, on the power, but also that... Uh, delivers the, the power to all the users. And it is this part where we wish to, to use quantum. Because this part is the difficult part that we have to search for um, valid reconfigurations in the last search page, search space, and here we, th we think quantum can help. So, Again, suppose that an active edge fails, we make reconfigurations. As you can see, we use two edges that we turn on and we use two edges that we turn off. And then we want to define an operator that uh, performs the load flow check. And these load flow checks are precisely the, the check does my valid does my reconfiguration adhere to the constraints that we impose up it uh, on it? Does my reconfiguration um, uh, does the current not exceed the limitations on each cable? Um, is the power within the bounds that we want? And after that, we want to use Grover's search algorithm to find these good switches. So to, to identify which of these reconfigurations is indeed valid one. And using Grover search algorithm, we can reduce the complexity from linear to square root, assuming we have this load flow check. So what we currently have is a linear scaling. We hope to go to a quadratic scaling. Okay, so we have this load flow check, but it's quite it's quite high level. It's quite difficult to see how this works. So we have to break it down. We have to actually implement it because an algorithm on paper is nice, but it doesn't help us solve a problem in, in practice. So what do we do? Well, if we open this, this white box up and we see that it contains two orange blocks, a green box. And the orange box is used to 
prepare the graph, prepare the network together with the edges that we want to turn on and off. And we perform a load flow check on this specific network. Then we uncompute the network again, because otherwise our search algorithm will fail. We, we cannot uh, correctly do it. Let's walk through it in time. And we see that we start with only the index of the reconfiguration. So only the index of the edges that we switch on and off. And then two zero registers. Afterwards, we have the index together with the encoding of our graph, the encoding of our network. We, the next step, obtain also the load flow check variable. So the variable that says if our, uh, if our reconfiguration is valid, yes or no. And then we uncompute graph again and then on this stage we can perform Grover's algorithm so we implemented this and then we see then we run some tests so the first test is where we have is two so we have one failure we have one edge that we want to switch on consider this network green edges indicate active ones blue edges gate active ones and we have one load flow compliant option and we see if we run Grover search algorithm for one iteration we indeed find this first um, first load flow compliant option with the highest probability if we increase the number of Grover iterations up to some point we can push this probability to be close to one If we go to a second second example, we have three load flow compliant options. We see that again, we find a load flow compliant option with high probability. Um, number four, the four five edge, gives a valid reconfiguration. If we then increase a pro the problem, so we go to KS6. In this case, we have three edges, three active edges that we want to turn off. We have three inactive edges that we want to turn on. And with the arrows, we indicated what the valid option is. And then we see that after one iteration, one Grover iteration, that's with, high, with the highest probability, uh, we find a valid reconfiguration. Even though this is the highest probability, it's still very, very small. So in practice, you would need to rerun the algorithm often. If we act, if we instead do six Grover iterations, then we see that we can boost this probability to already 0 0.24, 0 0.25. So in this case, in one quarter of the, the runs of the algorithm, we find in, indeed the load flow compliant option. So, we see that the gate-based quantum approach can solve the n-1 problem, can find valid reconfigurations for the for failing network, for edge failure. failure. And we also see that there's quadratic scaling in the number of load flow checks that we have to perform. But we also saw that there's some implementation details that, that do matter. And one is that the search base heavily influences the number of Grover iterations and also heavily influences the easiness with which we can implement these Grover iterations. So larger spaces are often easier to implement, but harder to search through, whereas smaller search spaces are harder to implement because you have to add extra checks um, to, to, to delimit the search base, but you can search through it much faster. We have to find an efficient encoding of a network in a quantum state. And we found an encoding, but it's it's um, it's possible that more efficient ones do exist. 
And in the current implementation, we implement the load flow check as an Oracle. And in practice, you would also need to implement the actual load flow implementation. But that would also call for too much extra information on every specific edge that for this proof of concept, it was too much. So next we, we turn to the quantum annealers. And quantum annealers can solve Ising problems. They can solve cubos. These two are mathematically equivalent. And these are mathematical formulations of problems. And interestingly, we can so, can write many, many uh, problems as a cubo formulation. So in theory, quantum annealers can solve these, can solve many, many problems. And in practice, cubos are MP hard. So you cannot actually um, solve cubos, but quantum annealers can find efficient uh, or can efficiently find approximative solutions to cubos. And we use the D wave quantum advantage or the D wave advantage device. It looks like this to run our experiments. So let's take one step back and instead of quantum annealing, look at adiabatic quantum computing. In adiabatic quantum computing, you start with a energy landscape that's very simple. And in this case, it's indeed simple. It's just a ball and the ground state of this ball is at the very middle. We slowly evolve this energy landscape to an energy landscape that corresponds to our problem. And if we do that slowly enough, then our quantum state, our ground state, our quantum state will remain in the ground state. And that's nice because if we stay in the ground state and we eventually measure our quantum state, then we have solved the problem because this hilly energy landscape that corresponds precisely to the problem that we're having and its ground state corresponds precisely to the answer to the problem we're encountering. And quantum annealing works similarly. However, quantum annealing, um, it does the same proce procedure, does it, it does it faster. So it evolves the Hamiltonian from simple to complex much faster. Therefore, your quantum state can leave the ground state. And even if it leaves the ground state, um, there's still some, some good probability that it's close to the ground state and that it's not too far. And that's also because of tunneling effect. And for many problems, it's sufficient if we have a good solution. If we have a good solution that's that's uh, approximately optimal, whereas it um, and it doesn't have to be actually optimal, and that's also the case in um, in the Aliander problem. We want a valid reconfiguration and not necessarily the best valid reconfiguration. So. You program an algorithm, you first set up the control system, you set up the uh, Hamiltonians, and then you anneal the Hamiltonian from simple to problem-specific complex, then measure the qubits out, then redo everything, because due to the noise, there's some probability that you end up here, but there's also some probability that you end up in this valley, that valley. You do this often and then you get some probability distribution from which we can find um, if we indeed found valid reconfigurations so this cube I was, I was talking about how does it actually look like and what how do we use that to solve the problem cubo is is the problem is we have a matrix we have some vectors and we want to minimize this value for x 
and this Q, this this Q, this matrix that corresponds to the problem that we're having. And that's something that we have to set up to correspond to um, where, the, where the minimum value actually corresponds to our problem solution. Again, we search for the is to, we do that classically because that's simple. And for the remaining 10%, the hard case, we use a quantum approach. And the quantum approach that looks like this HK, HX, and we need to have some penalty terms because we we need to make sure that the value that we found, find is indeed correct. And one of the penalty terms is that we need to have a spending tree because the electricity grid that Aliander has always is a spanning tree. Uh, there will never be cycles in this graph. So this penalty term assures that indeed no cycles will be present. We also have a penalty term that corresponds to the load flow compliant configurations. So that makes sure that the reconfiguration that we have is indeed load flow compliant. And the last penalty term that we have links the two uh, spanning tree load flow compliant uh, penalty terms with each other. So let's dive a little bit into the details. We first look at these, this three uh, penalty term. And the idea is that every tree, every spanning tree, is a rooted tree. So we can just pick one node as the root, and then from this graph, we obtain one on the right. And properties of rooted trees actually fit very nice in Cuba formulations. And one property is that every node in a rooted tree has exactly one depth. So if we go one step back, we see that the depth is indicated here by these numbers. So the root has depth one, one after that has, has depth two, depth, depth one, depth two, and then depth three. And there's also precisely one root node. And from that point on, we see that every non-root node is connected to precisely one node, which has a lower depth. And this also assures that you do have a tree. If it's connected with multiple nodes with lower depth, you will end up with cycles. And for the same reason, we also see that these nodes cannot have connections with other nodes at the same depth. So this is a valid spanning tree. This one is also a valid spanning tree because this edge is, is still with a node of a, of a lower depth. This one is not because this node two has two connections to the node of a lower depth, whereas it should have only one. And this one is also not valid because these two edges or at the same depth and have a connection. And then we continue to the load flow uh, penalty term. And in this load flow penalty term, we, we, we look at the classical algorithm. And the classical algorithm for the load flow checks is solving a linear system. And you solve this linear system and then check if you if the solution violates the constraints that you have. And these A and this, this F value which correspond to the graph that you have. So how do we do this in an optimization setting? That we encode the constraints into some vector, some vector U uh, hat, and then check if this minimum is close to zero. Because if this minimum is close to zero, it's very likely that these U hat, that this U hat factor does not violate the constraints. And finally, we have this penalty term that links the two together. Um, we skip that for now. It's it's doesn't really give information on how the problem is 
implemented. So let's look at some results. Suppose we have this input graph, we have a failing edge here. We have a failing edge here and this red edge is a non compliant Simulated annealing. So if you use a classical algorithm to run this quantum of if we use a classical way to run this quantum algorithm, we see that we end up with a valid reconfiguration. We do find this green edge. We do find valid reconfiguration of the, the failure network. So um, this proof of concept indeed shows that we can use a cubo to find spanning trees, to check for the load flow, and to indeed give a valid reconfiguration. But use simulated annealing. Why did we do that? Um, basically, because, for instance, this P3 tree, the penalty term for the tree, is very complex. And we do see some lambdas here lambda one, two, three, and four. And those correspond to some hyperparameters that we have to set. And we have to choose them in such a way that um, that all the, the constraints that we have on the tree are indeed imposed. However, the actual quantum hardware is very sensitive to these hyperparameters. So even a slight mischoice here, can can drastically affect the the results that we will find with our quantum algorithm. So we still wanted to run the algorithm on actual hardware, and for that we downsized the problem. We only considered four nodes. We did not consider a load flow check. And if we do not consider a load flow check, then we don't have the penalty term for the load flow check, and we don't have the penalty term that links the two together. So we actually only have this H in this P3 term. And then the, the formulation becomes much simpler. Three minutes, please. Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. I'll, I, I think I'm, I'm close to finished. I'm close to finished. Um, so we start with this input graph. And we see that even for this simple graph, we need 46 qubits already. And 46 qubits, it gives a, a tremendous number of possible outcomes. But we do see that the penalty term is zero for four possible outcomes. And these four possible outcomes respond precisely to um, the valid reconfigurations. So to where you switch on one edge and two ways switch on two, switch off one extra edge. And if you now look at the probability distribution there, you do see that only in a few cases, we actually find these valid reconfigurations. But we also see that We also see that um, many of the invalid solutions are actually of this kind. Uh, it's in the right valley, but not at the very bottom of that valley. And if it's here in this in this valley, then we can use the steepest descent to move our solution actually to the bottom. If we do that, then we can prove the solution, we actually find much more often the optimal solution. So what we do, we formulated the N minus one problem as a cubo formulation, and then successfully run this, this cubo uh, using simulated annealing hardware, and then used quantum annealing to solve a, a smaller version of this problem. And um, for the future, we, we, of course, want to increase the problem size of which we uh, can run the algorithm. And we want to have more information on which hyperparameters do we actually need to choose? How do we need to choose them? Okay. 
I think I'm uh, precisely within the three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your for your very interesting talk, Niels. Now I will ask the audience for questions. If there are any questions, I will check the, this. There are no questions in chat. Oh. Okay. I do, yeah. do see a question about improving the resilience in energy grids. Um, so have we considered quantum sensing for battery health monitoring to enable proactive maintenance and optimization of energy storage systems? Um, a good question, I must say. So within our department, we uh, have a limited focus on quantum sensing, and quantum sensing is, is located in different parts of, of TNO. Um, we have not looked into this. I do like the suggestion, I, and I will... will uh, communicate this back to the to the to the team because I do think that there's some something to gain here. So okay, do you recommend any good source for learning about quantum anything? Okay. Um so D Wave does offer some um some some material on how you can program data devices. I think that's quite interesting. You also have the leap environment of D Wave where you can actually run the algorithms on their hardware. So that might give some some uh some tips and pointers. Um furthermore the the I think it's interesting to see if you can, I think the, the best way is to, to look at a toy problem and see how you can actually implement it as a cubo. So for instance, uh, you have a paper, many um, MP formulations of many Ising problems. And I think that's a, that's a nice one to, to read, to, to see how you can formulate a, a problem as an Ising problem, as a cubo, which you can then run yeah. Um, wave hardware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have also here a message from uh, Erika and Alain yeah. for for D Wave. So, yeah. thank you very much once again for your talk. It was really very interesting. Um, we can continue with a talk of uh, friends of ours and from uh, allies and and uh, we will have uh, three short talks. And the first one will be Mario. Yeah. Okay. So can you hear me uh, well? Yeah. So Mario, the stage is yours. Thanks. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And we will be talking about benchmarking variational quantum algorithm. And we will also be describing some use case related with quantum chemistry. So let's start with the introduction. So quantum algorithms, as you know, is well, a cornerstone of quantum computing have been, some of them have been discovered to be very efficient and they can be applied already for real application. Like for example, the Fourier transform or for some specific type of quantum simulations is a very active field of research. And we wanted to, to understand and explain why it is important to benchmark these algorithms in using, taking into account the state, the current state of the quantum hardware that we have today. So as you know, we have nowadays several platforms. We have hardware which have limited number of qubits, uh, qubits which are noised. And sometimes we also have to, to consider that the quantum gates uh, can be applied only with some uh, timing. And, uh, and some quantum algorithms that have been proved to be efficient maybe are not suitable for the pure current quantum hardware that we have. So in nowadays, the so-called NISC algorithm have been trying to, to take the best of the current quantum hardware. And we can see that 
sometimes we have these hybrid schemes in which classical and quantum computers are working together to solve a problem. And in order to benchmark this kind of algorithm, we in HPC, in HPC environments, we of course we need to understand that which kind of work is going to be uh, associated with the classical or the quantum computer, but we also have to take into account that we will have different HPC resources, like a different package simulator. We can also use distributed computation and so on. And in this complexity, users want to, to understand how to benchmark this uh, algorithm. And also they wanted to see if something can be, some of these algorithms can be in fact uh, used as accelerators, or if they also provide uh, results which are accurate. So it's not only benchmark, it's also to compare with classical algorithm. And we will be talking about this and for a, one specific case that a user can uh, be interested on like uh, quantum chemistry, for example. So in the next slide, I will present the roadmap of this presentation. We will start with the basic concept of BQ for quantum chemistry and some, also some concept, concept of quantum chemistry. Then my colleague Bura will go more deep in these uh, topics and will talk about some specialization that can be used as well. And finally, we will finish, Amit, we will finish talking about some specific type of containerized benchmarking. So in the next slide, I will to talk about the basic aspect of, of BQE. And when we apply uh, BQE for chemistry, we start uh, with the variational principle in quantum chemistry, which is a very powerful principle used by several algorithms. We are thinking, we are considering that we uh, start with the bohr oppenheimer approximation. So we are considering all the nuclei of the molecules in our problem fixed, and we only compute the electronic energy of the molecules. Uh, in this case, if, uh, we will have like a several solution, discrete values associated with some bound state of the molecules, and our target will be the ground state. Now the variational principle state that if we have uh, some parametrized wave function, the energy uh, of this uh, parametrized wave function is always too high compared with the ground energy, the energy associated with the ground state. And therefore several algorithms focusing to get the optimal parameters to, to reduce this gap and to, Yes, and to in order to get the best uh, uh, value for, for the energy, giving a good representation of your wave function. So in the next slide, you will see that, well, the basic scheme for, for the VQE for chemistry, so in which we will start, of course, we have to take into account uh, that we have a quantum circuit with some parameters. Usually part of this circuit is dedicated to, to initialize uh, to prepare a, a, a wave function which is close or not too far away from the solution. For example, could be the hatred fog that can be prepared efficiently. And then we have another part of the circuit uh, ansatz. Then we have measurements, which are important to compute the expectation value. In this case, the energy, which are going to be, are going to be our loss function uh, for the classical optimizer. And we iterate this scheme many times to get uh, the optimal uh, parameters that will reduce uh, our energy as much as possible. Of course, in this, and just go back just for a second, just in this, uh, in this scheme, something that we have to keep into in our minds is that we need to map to the from the elect fermion representation to the qubit representation in order to define properly the expectation value of the energy. So in the next uh, slide, uh, I will just describe this uh, briefly. As you know, in the quantum chemistry, usually uh, one start with the second quantization, which is this electronic Hamiltonian presented in the, on the left. And this operator is given in terms of annihilator and creator operators, which have some specific anti-commutation relationships. And what we want is to map this to a new Hamiltonian uh, in terms of qubit gates that 
are suitable for for the quantum circuit. Most of the quantum circuits uh, have this qubit gate, and then you can compute expectation value in this way. And in the way, uh, what we are going to do is basically first the occupation numbers in the uh, in the fermion representation are going to be associated with uh, some uh, computational states. And when you have uh, one occupation in one of the spin orbital that could be associated with one specific state of the qubit, like for example, one or zero if it's not uh, occupied. And then there are different possibilities to map. The jordan wegener transformation is one of these, which map each of these a basic operator, the annihilator or creator operators, uh, in a way that this, this uh, uh, we get like a, an isospectral transformation that preserve the spectrum. In this jordan wegener transformation, for example, the, the last terms, which are these zeta operators, are just trying to uh, keep into account the phase factors that arise when we apply, apply the annihilator or creator operators in the fermion uh, formulations. So with that, we preserve the, the spectrum and then we can compute the expectation value correctly with our quantum circuit. But there is something else important about this jordan wegener transformation that is also very useful. And the next slide, I will talk about it. The next, in this, uh, this jordan wegener transformation is also useful when we create or design new ansatz for the VQE because we can start from a formulation like the fermion formulation, for example, the unitary couple cluster. And from that, in which you, uh, you have an, a wave operator that act, acting on the Hattrick-Fox state will provide you a much better wave function that take into account correlations and so on. And uh, for example, here, we can truncate uh, this operator, this uh, cluster operator, and I just show you one of the examples. Here you can see these operators are given in terms of annihilator creator operators as, as before. And we can use the Jordan, uh, Jordan Vinic transformation in order to map this kind of wave operators to a, a quantum circuit ansatz. Then this is uh, very uh, powerful that will provide uh, some quantum circuits that can work for different kind of system. Uh, and, uh, but the question is, again, is this the best solution? Is the only thing that we have to take into account? So in the next uh, slide, Burak, we are going to start to talk about more detail about these problems and what are the different options that we have. So please, Burak. Thank you, Mario. Um, so now we're gonna transition into the importance of the right answer selection. So, um, while building the VQE solution, there are certain steps to fulfill and also certain decisions to be made that significantly affect the accuracy of the model. Um, so as we have seen in the Mario's part of the talk, the very first thing to do is, of course, to build the molecular Hamiltonian of the system of interest in the qubit space using this jordan wigner transformation. And then we have to figure out what kind of a circuit we are going to use, what kind, uh, what is going to be the initial state of the system, and of course, how are, how are we going to measure it? And the rest of the decisions is all post-processing and all cl classical work, actually. So in the end, this is an optimization problem. You also have to have an optimizer, a loss function, and also the hyperparameters of the optimizer. Um, so whether you run your system on actual quantum hardware or on a simulator, uh, your solution can underperform just because of some uh, badly defined classical parameters, like a bad choice of optimizer, for example. Um, but those choices are generally selected via trial and error methods. Uh, so more interesting question is, how do you find the right quantum resources to incorporate in your solution, like the ANSA selection, for example? Um, next slide, please. Um, so as it turns out, there are actually criteria that makes an ANSA uh, powerful. Uh, so first of all, as this is a quantum algorithm, you can only um, harvest the advantages uh, of, of the algorithm using a quantum hardware. And running it on a quantum computer would work only if your ansatz is feasible uh, to be run on the quantum computer. And for the NISC era, uh, 
feasibility generally means that the ansatz should be shallow enough so that the, the ansatz is more resilient to noise and also the decoherence effects. And second of all, since V2 is essentially a hybrid algorithm, the classical part of it is also not uh, very optimal. Um, so the optimizers usually depends on some heuristics. And when there are many parameters involved in the search problem, the computational need for the optimizer also grows large. So that means it is better to characterize your solution with less number of parameters as possible in your in your ansatz. And it is also important that if such an optimal solution exists, uh, your ansatz should be able to reach that state. So the circuit uh, should be in universal in that sense. We can go to the next slide. And the um, first type of ansatz ansatz that answers the first criteria is the so-called hardware efficient ansatz. As the name suggests, it's not a fixed ansatz, but rather depend on the on the hardware criteria that you use, like the topology or the basis gate set uh, of your hardware. And the goal of this ansatz is to parameterize only a limited type of type of gates that are native to your machine and also relatively cheaper to execute in that hardware. Um, they enable the full exploration of the Hilbert space, meaning that the circuit uh, would be guaranteed to find that exact solution. However, it usually falls short for the second criteria that we have, because as your problem size increase, the number of parameters also explode. Um, so in summary, this ansatz gives you a mechanism to explore the full Hilbert space, uh, but the electronic wave function that we search for actually lives in a much um, confined, smaller subspace. So that means the exp full exploration can ac actually be a disadvantage. Um, next slide, please. And the main disadvantage uh, of this approach is the so-called Baron plateau problem. Um, I think it has also been mentioned uh, several times in previous talks already, but just, just for uh, completeness, um, you can make an ansatz more comp uh, complicated, uh, hoping that it will lead you uh, to the solution easier. However, as you add more degrees of freedom, the gradient landscape would start to become much sparse. So meaning that the extra operations that you have added do not contribute to the molecular energy configuration that much. So they, in a sense, overcomplicate the model and making the um, optimization a bit more harder. Uh, next slide, please. And one, um, try to overcome this problem was to build a problem oriented or problem inspired uh, solution instead. So in the quantum chemistry related problems, this leads into the um, UCC SD ansatz or unitary couple cluster ansatz. And the way they build the circuits is as Mario touched upon in the first part, you have fermionic excitation operators in the molecular setting and you simply exponentiate them with, with some theta parameter. And since the terms, like each fermionic terms do not commute among themselves, you have to do a trotterization of the, of the terms individually. So on the left side of the slides, you can see an example of such mapping. This is just one rigorous example of a double excitation. So you start from a double electron excitation that can also be represented as a linear combination of poly uh, birds or poly terms in the qubit space. <clears throat> then you further exponentiate them and inside of a quantum circuit, you can do it uh, with a so-called C not letter type of circuits. You also see them a lot in the QIOA type of ansatzes. And so the advantage is that you build a chemistry informed solution because of the gates or, or the operators that you use come from the uh, chemistry background, the fermionic operators. So they require more convenient operations, but as you can see, the circuits could get quite deep. So this is just an example of a single um, double excitation operator, and you might have a hundreds of hundreds of operations like this. So the circuits can get actually quite deep. And the next slide, please. And one intelligent try to improve this ansatz even further is so-called the particle number preserving ansatz. Um, it has a similar approach to the UCC SD ansatz. So we still use or harvest the um, fermionics excitation operators as a base. 
And we exploit the fact that in our system of interest, there exists a particle symmetry. Um, so again, as Mario touched upon, the possible states for a system should always include the same number of ones in the computational basis form. Uh, that's simply because the number of electrons are always preserved and in the qubit space, um, in the computational base, basis states, one means a spin orbital being occupied by an electron or not. And each electron, um, one spin orbital simply becomes um, sparse and another spin orbital will be one so that the total number of ones should always be preserved. And there is a set of SU4 gates that are called the Givens rotations. Uh, they could be parameterized and they always preserve the, this particle symmetry. And that means that um, if an input state is a superposition of states with the same number of ones, uh, for example, in the right, there are six qubits and only two of the spin orbitals are occupied. So there are two ones in the in this cat notation. And the output of applying the Givens rotation would always yield another superposition of the same subspace. So just a linear combination of uh, states that only have two ones in it um, or the same number of electrons. So this way we can shrink the search space uh, because we know a priori the number of electrons of the system that we are interested in. And we prepare the initial state accordingly and we always stay in this uh, confined subspace. And we can go to the next slide. And the final ANSAS that I'm uh, going to explain is, um, is one of the state-of-the-art methods. It's called the ADAPT VQE methods. It is a try to keep still keep the ideas from the chemistry inspired ansatz, but also trying to reduce the complexity of the model as much as possible. And so as it turns out for a certain molecular configurations, some of the fermionic operators inside the operator pool does not contribute to the energy. So if you remember, you had to do the trotterization uh, that will yield a large or deep circuit but that means some portions of the circuit simply does not play a role in the solution at all. They don't contribute to the energy. So in the ADAPT DQE, um, you calculate the gradients of each operator in the pool. Then you then you choose the operators with the large gradients. Uh, so the ones that will actually have importance to the energy and you add them to your ansatz one by one. And you can get rid of the operators that have zero gradients and in some cases, this number is relatively big, so you can make the circuit shorter with no cost on the solution accuracy. Um, so that makes the ansatz much more accurate compared to the other ansatzes. But the biggest challenge of this ansatz is the time to solution, uh, because calculating the gradient with respect to the Hamiltonian for every operator is a, a costly classical operation. And you can actually still use a quantum computer to calculate the gradients, but we still need an, an intelligent integration between the classical compute powers and the, and the quantum jobs. Um, we can go to the final slide. Um, so, and finally, some, some results on the performance of this, of this uh, different ansatzes. Um, so these plots are from the original ADAPT VQ paper, and you can see the references down the, uh, below the page. So they use the lithium hydride, beryllium hydride, and the hydrogen molecule and produce the energy plots. Um, so they were all simulated, uh, but it can, be, um, it can be seen that the ADAPT VQE methods yield a very accurate energy expectation and even slightly better than the UCCSD method, but the slight improvement is actually relevant uh, in, in terms of the chemical accuracy. But it's also important to mention that the ADAPT also gives shallower circuits compared to the UCCSD method. So if you were to run this on an actual quantum computer, it will be hopefully more resilient to, to noise. Um, and that being said, it's very hard to actually compare the ansatzes, like, like the, all the ansatzes that you have, because there are many other external factors, such as the op optimizer implementation, choosing the suitable hyperparameters. And it also relies heavily on the software packages, frameworks that you choose to use. 
And that um, justifies the need of a robust framework for benchmarking um, that reduces the effect of these external classical factors and can also provide a fair ground for making comparison between all these, all, all these parameters. And I will now leave the floor to Amit to talk more about the framework in, in more detail. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes of course. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a bit under weather, so to say. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Burak, for that. So, uh, we so quantum simulators are sort of uh, being used, sort of in two regimes, so to say, which is to sort of validate the quantum hardware and also to sort of explore the regime of quantum advantage. So, the main uh, focus of uh, my part of the talk would be to sort of use quantum chemistry use cases and sort of use quantum simulators to sort of uh, benchmark the performance of various simulators, so to say. So there are different kinds of quantum simulators uh, that that we currently have. Basically, the state vector one, the density matrix, the tensor networks, uh, ZX calculus, and some architecture-specific packages, basically. And uh, each one has its uh, own unique advantages and disadvantages as well uh, that come along with it. For instance, the state vector representation uses the uh, all the state entries of the wave function, which is basically two power n uh, entries if there are n qubits in the system. But this doesn't sort of incorporate uh, noise into it. For that, we have to use density matrix, which basically scales now as two power n cross two power n, so to say. and even these are sort of, we clearly see that now we need like, uh, it is sort of uh, limited to small lens that we can simulate on classical systems, so to say. So there have been cleverer approaches, basically tensor network based approaches where they have used matrix product states and pips and things like these to sort of simulate quantum circuits. There have been other works as well in tensor networks where they've mapped uh, state preparation techniques onto unitaries and things like this. Then there's been a whole field of ZX calculus, which is basically uh, used heavily in uh, error correction and things like this, and also for circuit optimization. And then we have the architecture specific packages, which are biscuit metal, iron sim, and things like this, where they sort of look at simulation of specific quantum hardware. Uh, in in this part, I'll basically uh, use state vector simulators to sort of analyze the performance of quantum chemistry algorithms, so to say. So uh, a general scheme of benchmarking can be sort of uh, broadly looked at this way, where we have three inputs uh, uh, to the tool chain or the pipeline that we want to sort of establish, which is basically the a selection of the simulation package. Uh, there are lots available, so to say, but the focus uh, uh, has been to sort of choose which support uh, HPC capabilities, uh, such as these here. And then uh, the key central uh, thing is the quantum algorithm, which is one other input, so to say, which basically takes in a wave function, uh, has some rotation gates, some variational parameters, and then we do the measurements and then, or compute the expectation values. And then uh, we sort of can uh, want to sort of get out the performance characteristics, so to say, which is basically either the time to solution or the memory consumption. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> So what are the main challenges in sort of doing an end-to-end -end automation of this is it is basically time consuming and uh, 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 fo not foolproof. That is uh, recasting each quantum algorithm in the instruction set of the simulation package uh, is not always uh, foolproof because we can sort of miss instructions while we are rewriting this in uh, different packages, so to say. 
and it is also time consuming because you have to adapt it to each uh, package so to say and then uh, even if we do such a thing basically uh, the reproducibility of the data and the portability of the benchmarking schemes uh, still seems to be an issue so to say because if we can't transfer the entire setup to a new hpc cluster or things like this and deploy it and sort of test it for ourselves and then the simulation packages themselves have frequent release tags so to say so <clears throat> we have to sort of adapt the tool chain uh, to these uh, frequent release tags so to say so these are some of the challenges in sort of setting up a, a tool chain so to say <clears throat> and we sort of have proposed a containerized tool chain solution where we have installed all the simulation packages on a container and then sort of ask the user for three inputs, which is on a broad scheme, three inputs, but I'll sort of detail what we are doing in the diagram below, which basically takes in the simulation package, the quantum algorithm and the compute capability and basically spits out the performance benchmarks. And this is all end-to-end -end automated, so to say. And if you look at the details of this, it basically takes in four inputs. We also included the precision because not all packages support all precision, so to say. And uh, we sort of request the user to sort of input the quantum algorithm with the variational parameters in, in a Quasm instruction format. And then we sort of append a optimization function to the bottom of this and then generate uh, package specific instruction sets, so to say. So we basically translate the Quasm instruction set into the pa package uh, specific instruction set while appending it with like an optimizer of choice. Basically, we have used the SciPy optimizer for now. And then we, uh, in the next step, we basically sort of generate the job script files and also the scope linker files that basically scope the run files into the uh, scope of the container, so to say. And then we sort of execute the job scripts. And as a final processing step, we extract the time and memory and sort of analyze what we get from them, so to say. So what are the advantages of using such a containerized tool chain? Uh, uh, it, the containers are portable, so the pipelines are portable, so that helps in the reproducibility of uh, the results, so to say. So we can just share the container images and then the results can be sort of uh, reproduced, so to say. And then also the components of the pipeline are modular. That is not each, each component here can be sort of developed independently. It doesn't sort of restrict the tool chain, so to say. And then uh, the parsers that we have implemented that translate the Quasm to the pa package specific instruction set uh, is sort of, uh, can also be sort of developed with the evolution in Quasm, so to say, because Quasm itself is evolving, uh, which is like an intermediate representation and it's, it, it, it in itself is evolving, so to say. So we can sort of, uh, sort of develop the parser, so to say, to incorporate the new changes. And it is also extensible, like we can include other simulation packages, uh, so to say, and also uh, integrate this into, uh, like we can sort of have a final option to sort of execute some circuits on quantum hardware as well. <coughs> Sorry. One thing I forgot to uh, highlight is in the variation, as, we are, as our focus is on the variational uh, quantum algorithms, the quantum evolution uh, of the state vector is timed and uh, the optimization uh, is also timed. In sense, the classical optimization is also timed, so to say. Uh, I'll sort of just briefly uh, present some of the results that we have, so to say. Is, is my screen still visible? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, this is basically run on the cluster set LRZ, so to say. So we've just accumulated the results into uh, into such kind of a, a display using the Mercury app, 
which is open source. Uh, so here we have basically compared five packages, uh, six packages, yeah, but we like we could do many others as well because the container image that we we are developing, so to say, has many other packages in it, so to say. So here, if we basically look at the different things in the plots, basically, the the blue ones are the different number of initializations. So to start with, we are considering the H2 molecule. This is the SuperMOOC NG cluster, and the ansatz is basically a very generic ansatz, so to say, which has many barren plateaus. So, and to sort of uh, look at uh, a holistic picture, we take 1,000 initializations uh, and then sort of run the uh, VQE, so to say, for each of the initializations. And <clears throat> as we see for the generic ansatz, the the number of iterations that, or the number of trajectories that, uh, or the number of initializations that uh, hit the solution are basically uh, less than one. Uh, this is normalized by thousands, so to say. So we just divided by thousands. So, uh, <clears throat> and we see that the ansatz is not great. Uh, uh, the other key feature that uh, we see is that the quantum time, uh, which is basically the evolution for the state vector using different solvers in these packages uh, is basically uh, sort of varying, so to say. And Intel QS sort of seems to perform uh, fastest among these. And just to sort of go through the other things in the legend, it is the number of iterations for the optimization, so to say, and the number of objective evaluations, which is basically the expectation value. Here we could also compute the number of shots and see how the uh, how the simulator performs, so to say. And then the classical time is the time taken by the optimizer to sort of do its thing, so to say. So this is basically the native SciPy uh, optimize. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we could also look at uh, single feature comparisons. So. This is the number of trajectories, uh, successful trajectories, basically. And we see that Qiskit doesn't sort of uh, hit the uh, same number of uh, successful uh, initializations as the others, so to say. Uh, probably the important thing would be the quantum time. And here we clearly see that uh, Intel QS is sort of you know, outperforming the others, so to say, for H2. We could also look at uh, UCC ansatz, but I guess uh, that would be, it would make more sense if we sort of compared it uh, across, diff if we compared different ansatz for a single package, so to say. Um, so here we clearly see that for the UCC ansatz, we, always hit the optimal solution because this goes to one. Whereas for the generic ansatz, we don't hit the optimization. But on the flip side, the time, the average time for evolution of the uh, successful uh, trajectories is sort of, it is fast, uh, but here it is slower, so to say. So if we, this is sort of a trade-off that we can think of, like if we want like, perfect solutions, then we need more time given any initialization. Or if we sort of want to have like some solution, so to say, then we could sort of choose this ansatz and then sort of get some quick insight into how the problem is running, so to say. We've also compared this across different uh, clusters, but I, I, I don't think that that makes much sense because uh, this is a bit of a, uh, like the, the generational difference between the compute clusters has been a bit uh, different, so to say. So th the results are almost the same except for some deviations in quantum time. But yeah, if we magnify it, it sort of becomes more visible, so to say. So yeah, I guess with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for their attention. So. Okay, so many thanks to the speakers
of uh, the last uh, of the last word to Mario Bragg and Damid, and I will ask to the audience for the questions. I would like to check the uh, the chat. If there is a question in the chat. I think there's one question by Jake asking if the web interface also allows you to run the performance benchmarks for VQE, um, not only display the results. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't think so. It's just like a pretty, <laughs> it is a, a basic thing to display plots. So I, I don't think that can be integrated. So I, I'm not sure. I've not thought through it, but yeah. I, at least for me, it, it, it is not too easy to do that, probably. And there was a comment on adding grid lines to the comparison graphs. Yes, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, these were just some pre preliminary results that we were working on, so yeah. This is, this is a question, if the tool is accessible online, uh yes and no <laughs> maybe you could write to us and maybe we could share something with you because uh yeah we are due to some issues we are not allowed to share the link outside so to say so yeah so if there are no more questions then let me thanks to all speakers uh then uh, for their time for coming and giving their, their talks it was really beautiful uh, to to share the time with you and to the end uh, and my name of Mary Lampard and the team of uh, IT for innovations I would like to thank all attendees for for coming and if you have any further comments uh, and uh, questions for the next even please don't hesitate and inform us because we are doing and organizing these type of workshops exactly for you and for our uh, for our friends um, to celebrate quantum computing because this is a really unbelievably strong and powerful topic. So uh, thank you once again for coming and uh, hope to see you next next year on the same time of event because we are organizing it every year. So thank you very much and thanks to the speaker once again. It was beautiful. Thank you for coming.